I work in the Department of Nanoengineering where we use a variety of small particles, nano-sized tools, to improve human life um, in air diverse areas including medicine as well as energy. My lab studies ultrasound and this is a very exciting project where we're using ultrasound to improve dental health. Many people are familiar with ultrasound in obstetrics and monitoring pregnancy, but it's used in a variety of applications, but rarely in dentistry. We think this is a very exciting application of ultrasound to improve what's known as the pocket depth measurement. The current approach to assessing gum health includes the pocket depth measurement. And what it essentially does is measures how strong does the soft tissue of the gum stick to the bone of the tooth. So in a, a very healthy gum, there's a lot of attachment between the tooth and the gum. But over time, due to infection or inflammation or poor dental hygiene, there can be detachment between the tooth and the gum. And that leads to a deeper pocket. So if you've ever had this done, and they, they read off numbers, three, four, six, seven, three, that's how many millimeters this little stick can go in between the tooth and the gum. The deeper it goes, the, less, the, the sicker the tooth is. So there's a tremendous amount of variability in the force. So you can imagine if there's a lot of pressure being placed, the probe will go deeper into the gum. If there's a small amount of pressure, the probe does not go very deep into the gum. So studies have shown that there's a variability as high as 40 to 50% between technician to technician and between dental practice to dental practice. What this leads to then is unnecessary treatment as well as a lack of treatment if patients are underdiagnosed or overdiagnosed with dental disease. There's also a tremendous amount of pain involved in this process, and this can lead to bleeding and can in fact even lead to additional new infections. Um, it also takes a lot of time. So if we're imagining in ways that we could reduce costs in healthcare, if we could either see more patients per unit time or reduce the number of caregivers that are needed for a patient, um, we could uh, uh, allow more patients to have access to dental care. One of the most exciting features of this approach is that we're measuring the entire pocket depth. You could imagine that if the technician probes to the left side of the tooth or the right side of the tooth or the center part of the tooth, they could miss or identify disease in a very variable approach. So there may be a, a region that has a very deep pocket, but because they're to the left or the right of that pocket, they don't identify it. Therefore, the patient is, will have disease that isn't treated. What we're doing with imaging is imaging the entire pocket of every tooth. So we can see the contours of the pockets and the depths of the pocket throughout the region and not just looking at individual parts. It's the difference between looking in a dark room with a flashlight versus turning on the entire room lights. When the patient appears at the dental office, they would first be given an oral rinse with a squid ink contrast agent. So this is the same kind of squid ink that people use in pastas and various other types of foodstuffs throughout the Mediterranean region. Um, it's considered quite a, quite a delicacy. What we've done is slightly reformulated it into a more liquid format, so essentially just diluted this food grade um, ingredient into a more liquid um, form. The patient would then rinse their mouth with this, similar to any mouth rinse, and capillary action would increase the amount of this squid ink between the tooth and the gum. The patient would then undergo a ultrasound imaging event, and the current generation uses a transducer that looks very similar to this. So you would imagine the, the, the patient um, laying back in their chair, like in a traditional dental chair, and then having this transducer placed next to the tooth and the gum. This is what we've done in our preliminary studies. Our long-term vision is that we're building a special transducer that looks like this kind of mouthpiece, that the patient would just essentially place this in their mouth, close their mouth, and zip! All of those pocket depths would be taken instantly and then even beamed wirelessly back to the patient's chart. We actually got the idea for squidding with a uh, dinner with some Japanese colleagues and we were discussing some of the various cuisines throughout the world and we realized that squid ink actually contains a very high concentration of melanin nanoparticles. So melanin as uh, 
you might know is involved in hair and skin coloration. It's a dark, light-absorbing molecule. And these animals create these melanin nanoparticles to avoid predators. But we realized that it would also absorb a large amount of light. And that's a technique and a feature that we need in this type of ultrasound known as photoacoustic ultrasound. Photoacoustics is light in, sound out, as opposed to sound in, sound out, as in traditional ultrasound. Alexander Graham Bell originally described photoacoustic imaging about 100 years ago, but it hasn't been used in human imaging until the last 5 to 10 years. In photoacoustics, incident light on the tissue is absorbed, and that absorption creates a small amount of heat, and that heat creates a pressure difference. And that pressure difference with the right kind of transducer can actually be detected acoustically and converted into an image. What's great about it is it has a lot of contrast, um, contrast being the difference between a specific area and the background area. So how much difference do we have? And that's why we use this squid ink nanoparticle, because it absorbs a lot of light and can convert that light then into sound, and hence can be used to measure the pocket depths. It actually tastes slightly bitter, slightly salty. Um, you can imagine that this has a lot of salts and um, other stabilizers in it. Long term, we'll imagine that we will add some wintergreen, some other type of mints to make it more palatable, but um, as of now, it's slightly salty. An important thing is that this is not going to turn your teeth black. We spent a lot of time in this manuscript studying how stable is this dye when it's on the teeth. And we were really happy to see that if the patient would, or excuse me, at least in our model, if we rinse the teeth with water, the dye remained in the pockets. But then when we back, went back and brushed the teeth, that this, uh, this, this squid ink was very quickly removed with a simple tooth brushing. What's next is moving into real clinical trials. So we actually have an IRB approval, which is the necessary uh, permission required to do a study in human beings. So we're recruiting volunteers and we're working with our dental colleagues to correlate the measurements that we make with our novel ultrasound approach to the gold standard method that a dentist would approach. So using this in real human patients as opposed to the animal models that we've done in our initial projects. We're also really excited to start building this kind of mouthpiece that would allow for instantaneous scanning of the entire mouth as opposed to this sort of point by point approach that we're doing with our current ultrasound transducer. Ultimately, the goal here is not only to increase the quality of care that patients receive, but also the number of patients who have access to dental care. You can imagine that um, this technique is relatively low cost and is easy to apply broadly. So we could imagine that not only does the care get better, but more patients have access to this care.